Good evening and welcome once again to We Got Planning News for You. Thank you all very much indeed for joining us. Uh, as you know by now, if you're regular viewers, um, please can you consider making in, in place of registration fee a, a donation to charity, either one of your choice or to one of our favourite charities, um, including Brian May's um, Save Me Trust, um, the Nature Charity, Shelter for the Housing Crisis or the GoFundMe uh, Ukraine uh, page. Um, now, we're very pleased uh, indeed to welcome this evening um, Sir Bob Neill, uh, one of the founding fathers of the NPPF back in uh, 2012 and now chair of the Justice Select Committee. It wouldn't be a We Got Planning News for You uh, if we didn't have technical issues. <laughs> Sir Bob is uh, currently in the process of logging in. He will be joining us shortly. Um, but whilst we're waiting um, for that, uh, let's introduce the rest of the panel. Um, Mary, you're back. Uh, that, I haven't seen that back for ages. I know. I thought I'd show you the wild wood in Wandsworth again. Past. Yes, a blast from the past. I'm in the in the basement in Wandsworth, and you can see the woods. And um, I yes, I I'm hoping that um, we will be joined by um, our esteemed guest, Sir Bob. Anyway, nice to see you. And I'm being very good. I'm on the water or on the wagon, as they say. Great stuff, Mary. Great to see you, Paul. What the heck is that behind you? Well, I'm talking to you now from the headquarters of Network North. Um, this is uh, our latest project at the moment, and it's going well, as you can see. So, uh, no, not really. I'm actually at Southampton Airport, so I'm currently in a Premier Inn, uh, but I thought this was far more exciting to put up. Um, so, I'm drinking water because I'm driving at the, at the other end, but it's lovely to see everyone, and fingers crossed Bob comes on. Hey, <laughs> great to see you. Sasha and your peloton, how are you both? Yeah, well recognised, Charlie. We're both well. Thank you very much. I am in London and I'm about to go do a quiz after this. So I'm much looking forward to to winning. <laughs> Fantastic. And Chris, how are you? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm very well, Charlie. Thank you very much. I'm at home. Uh, just been sorting out the, the recycling. There's seven bins, so it takes a long time, as you can imagine. Uh, presumption's here. I don't know if you see that. Yeah, you see Presumption? He's uh, been watching videos today. Um, what have you been watching? Hmm. Knives out. He's been following the party coverage at the Tory party conference very closely. Cheers, Chris. Um, good. Well, Charlie Vada here. I, uh, as we have an MP from the Westminster bubble, I thought I'd get myself into a Somerset bubble. I am in the bubble, which quite literally in the garden of the hotel I'm staying in for an inquiry, actually in Wiltshire, but um, we happen to be staying in Somerset. So, so there we are. Now, um, we're going to crack on with the news, and uh, Chris, you're going to give us a news update, which you promise will be four minutes, and none of us I, you. I promise it will be before the end of the show, that's absolutely right. The um, uh, the position is, goodness me, Spellthorn, we covered this last time, didn't we, that the Rachel McLean had sent a letter to Spellthorn Council saying, uh, you must not withdraw your plan, which the council were considering. Well, goodness, the leader... Um, Joanna Sexton from Spellform Council has written back to uh, Rachel McLean. This is what she says. Like most councils, we've been waiting on the updated MPPF since it was promised in May 2023, and there's still no definitive timetable for its publication. Your own planning inspectors have already agreed to pause other examinations, Mole Valley and Solid Hole, for exactly this reason. The council have been preparing their local plan for an unprecedented period of instability in the planning system, with the major reforms being proposed, which seem to change with the wind. The 2017 white paper fixing the broken housing market, which you reference in your letter, was replaced in 2020 with another white paper setting out a different approach to plan making. In turn, this was replaced with yet another white paper in 2022, setting out another set of reforms, which are now being progressed through the Leveling Up and Regeneration Bill. And she points out that um, it's surprising that it didn't intervene in Basildon and Castle Point, um, which have uh, plans um, which were older, and um, and they, of course, uh, withdrew their plans. So a very interesting reply, and um, I don't think Rachel McLean has replied yet, but no doubt that's on its way. Equally interesting is the fact that um, Greenwich Council have issued uh, an enforcement notice against two very large towers in relation to the um, the two high-rise buildings um, by Coma Homes Group, and they issued that um, uh, last week. And the developer has come back and said um, that it's an unnecessary step. Um, and this will obviously have to be played out in an enforcement 
uh, appeal, I would think. Looking at the variations, the council said there are significant variations. In fairness of reporting, the developer says they're not significant. Um, but what a fan, you know, what a, an extraordinary development to require the demolition of major development, which is actually occupied. Um, so good luck to whoever gets those enforcement notices. They'll be interesting cases. And then finally, from the Conservative Party conference, I was going to mention the fact that HS2 is not going ahead, but it turns out that's not news. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> Just to Birmingham. Um, anyway, thanks, Chris. Now, Paul, you're going to tell us about a case in Chichester, lovely part of the world. I, I am, which is where I spent the entirety of this week, um, Charlie. So I've been at, dealing with an inquiry literally the next village along. So I had to read this appeal decision to assist me with the inquiry. So I'm huge <laughs> Sasha for organising that. Uh, he does like to uh, to ensure that uh, uh, we, we have our time minimised, so thank you. So this is the decision of Mr Inspector David Troy, issued on the 18th of September, uh, after an inquiry which took place uh, back in July. It was a non-determination appeal by Metis Homes against Chichester District Council, involving the redevelopment of an existing breaker's yard operation. It's actually a really interesting operation because it's the only time I've ever clicked on a website selling cars that are all broken. It's brilliant. It's well worth en uh, entertaining. Um, but it's on the cent it's on the edge of the settlement of Nutbourne, which you will all know is about five kilometres to the west of Chichester, just up the road from Fishbourne Palace, a site just on the edge of the settlement boundary, but outside of it. But there's no five-year land supply. Uh, so the council uh, resolved to resist the appeal, but just on a very specific basis, a lack of contribution towards mitigation works on the A A27 and other infrastructure issues, both of which were resolved by the time of the inquiry. But third parties were opposing matters on the base of a whole raft of things, which is why the decision's uh, a, a little long. So there's nothing earth shattering about the decision, um, but on the face of it, it's it's a practically unopposed appeal in circumstances where there's no five-year land supply. Uh, as of yesterday, the council was saying it's 4.65. Main policy is out of date and no technical deal breaker. But there are two interesting takeaways on it. Uh, the first of which is um, there's no five-year land supply, but the council back in November of 2020 adopted an interim planning statement where they set out 12 criteria that need to be met for size to be brought forward uh, outside of the plan process because they didn't have a five-year land supply. Uh, as of, what are we, October 2023, uh, not a single site, as we understand it, has been granted pursuant to the interim planning statement by the council. They've all been granted on appeal. Uh, so, frankly, uh, great that they make good their intention, but if you make good your intention, you need to follow through with actually dealing with it. That's what public governance is about. And then the second thing is the A27 contribution. Um, so this is a huge problem in this neck of the woods. The A27 um, is definitely... Uh, difficult to travel down at peak hours and there's a whole mitigation scheme which costs tens of millions of pounds which the council wants to fund the national highways wants to fund from development perfectly reasonably but the problem is mppf says you can't do that paragraph 34 until you've got an adopted policy in place and you've got the details there so what happens if you have a plan delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed in advance well the answer is you probably can't get it because you, you've got to meet reg one two two and there's uh, competing decisions out there saying that. But it's maybe something to think about that the PPG needs to cover it uh, because otherwise you end up with those that are doing the job properly and waiting to the end of the plan-led system and then making their applications end up paying more than those who are rightly trying to meet the five-year land supply and bringing sites forward early. It's a bit of a mess out there. So that's not born uh, by name and by nature. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks, Paul. And before I go to Sasha to the next case, Bob, welcome. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Great uh, to see you. the way through the technology. After that, it wouldn't be a live show if we didn't have some kind of technical bit <laughs> happen to all of us. Where are you joining us from? Uh, where uh, are you? I'm from I, I'm from not so sunny Chislehurst, so uh, oh. in the constituency. So in, in the study at eight. Excellent. Well, we're really looking forward to um, the interview that Mary's going to leave with you in a few minutes' time. Great. Um, Sasha's, uh, Sasha's now going to tell us about a case in Watford, and then I'm going to deal with. Um, uh, one in Southwark, and then over to the interview. So, Ash, over to you. Thank you very much, Charlie. And as I've said privately to Bob by email, Bob has the privilege of representing the greatest constituency <laughs> in these <laughs> islands, uh, the birthplace of my mum. So, um, welcome. Very important. Thank you. Very <laughs> important too, Sasha. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and also not far away from the home of the greatest team in cricket, Ken. Uh, well, I remember. So. 
Brilliant. Well, so am I, so we can bond over that and all the tricks right. we've won. <laughs> You're on for that. <laughs> That'll be quick. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got an hour. <laughs> um, right. I will, I'm going to take you up to the less sunny climbs of Hertfordshire and discuss a, an appeal in Watford. And this is quite an interesting appeal because it, it is a trend, obviously, of making better use of urban land. And as we can see, it's a built-to-rent scheme of 247 units in Watford. And the appeal was made by Vendos Limited. And we can see the inspector was O.S. Woodward's inquiry held in August and September. The note, final day for September, decision date on the 26th of September. So one can infer that the inspector felt pretty young, clearly, that permission should be allowed, as we can see from paragraph one. Now, I, the takeaways from this decision for our viewers are the inspector, frankly, applies the tilted balance and and the flat balance in the in a very effective way. Effectively, he says the tilted balance doesn't make a difference because the flat balance is so persuasive. And I think it's a very good example of the proper weight being given to the benefits. And I think the inspector was particularly keen on on the housing. He was particularly keen on the bill to red rent element. He was very keen on, as we can see, it was a mixed-use scheme with Class C floor space, which the conclusion was that was 600 full-time equivalent jobs. And I think that, that overall, I think there was also another point, which I think is very relevant for our viewers, fallback. There was an extant permission on this site, but the developers made the case that they accepted that the existing consent was not viable. And it's interesting, in those circumstances, the inspector concluded it wasn't a fallback correctly with the case law. However, it was a material consideration that he needed to bear bear in mind. And Paul, don't look too puzzled. Yeah. <laughs> People, people pay you a reasonable amount of money sometimes to tell the difference between a, a fallback and a material consideration. Of course, Mary immediately gets the subtlety of difference. <laughs> so, no. So, overall, I think it's a, it's a quite a powerful exposition of the implementation of the MPPF on sustainable urban sites and, frankly, the increasing trend for tall buildings in our urban areas. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks, Sasha. Now, every Saturday or Sunday, uh, every second Saturday or Sunday, the rest of us get an email from Sasha finding out whether we won or lost in the lottery of allocation of case reports. So this this week, or oh, one, because he got a case he had to read anyway and be paid to. I, however, have got a decision that involves, in fact, four different appeals and 226 pages, which I have to summarise in the next three and a half minutes. Thanks, Sasha. Really appreciate it, mate. So... Um, this was a decision by uh, planning, uh, Housing Minister Rachel McLean uh, dealing with Great Portland Estates, two alternative proposals to redevelop an uh, office block in St. Thomas Street, uh, London by the Southwark, Southwark in London, and replace it with a tall building. And there were two options, a 26 or 30 story, 37 story options, providing um, uh, 50,000 odd square metres of commercial floor space uh, overall. Uh, they were uh, refused uh, based on the scheme's potential harm to nearby heritage assets and the harm to the area's townscape character and appearance. Overall, as I said, there were four schemes, A, B, C, and D, in the uh, appeal decision. Appeal A concerns uh, the 37-storey block. Um, appeal um, uh, C, uh, I think I've got the right, was the uh, was the smaller um, uh, block. Uh, and then there were um, B and D, which were applications for listed building consent um, for the restoration of a nearby Georgian listed terrace and the reconstruction of, of a 19th century building known as Keats House. Um, and these were to be tied into the tall building schemes by 106 and thus held out as benefits of these schemes that would be heritage benefits. Uh, agreeing with the inspector, Clear Searson, uh, the minister dismissed the planning appeals uh, for both tower blocks but allowed the listed building consent appeals um, for the restoration works. Um, for the planning appeals, um, the minister, uh, in agreement with the inspector, gave significant weight to the various uh, benefits in terms of office floor space, affordable workspace, public garden, as well as the restoration of the Georgian Terrace uh, and substantial weight to their sustainable transport benefits. The jobs uh, during the construction operational phases also got significant weight. 
However, none of that uh, collectively outweighed the harm identified. And in relation to heritage, the inspector and the Secretary of State identified harm to a range of designated heritage assets, including those of the highest significance, including high end and less than substantial harm, the Borough High Street Conservation Area, and to the Grade Two Star Guys Hospital, lesser levels of harm to the Grade One list of buildings in question, and the Tower of London World Heritage Site. In relation to Tower Townscape, uh, the Inspector and Secretary of State agreed that. Whilst both schemes would have commendable attributes in architectural and public realm terms, um, nonetheless, good design, as the inspector said, in what I might say was a particularly erudite decision, um, good design cannot exist in a vacuum. And it, despite the site being broadly set in terms of the principle of tall buildings, there will be significant harms caused, particularly due to the juxtaposition position with lower level development, which would be dwarfed, uh, and the impact on the public realm. Uh, by the developments, um, and particularly their scale and mass. I think in terms of key take-homes, it's another instance of, of a tall building scheme being found to be high-quality architecture in its own right, but not appropriate for its location. There's been a few such decisions uh, recently along the same vein. A building which is beautiful in itself is not well-designed if it doesn't relate well to its surroundings. And there's a sample policy basis for this in the, in the development plan in this instance, but it's clear once again that the MPPF design policies in the last iteration of the framework, or last but one now, provide further tools for such an objection to be articulated. And lastly, I, I was struck by paragraph 13.11 of what I said was a particularly erudite uh, inspector's report where, where Inspector Searson said an assessment uh, of design is perhaps one of the most debated areas in planning. What represents beauty and delight to some is also considered a monstrosity to others. The development of Shard is a case in point. As to date, it's still the focus of debate as to whether it's a positive influence on the London skyline or is negative. The fundamental issue in play in these cases raised at differences of opinion and in judgment. And in this particular instance, uh, these appeals, the parties were so far apart in their views on the success of the schemes in design terms. It's no surprise. It's now before myself to consider and the Secretary of State to adjudicate. Now, a point that the decision uh, and the inspector report don't address explicitly, probably because they didn't need to in this case, is um, what's the approach to that adjudication? Bear in mind that the subjective nature of design, is it for the decision maker to impose their subjective view? So if they hate the scheme, no matter what anybody else might think, then you dismiss. Or, or should a more liberal approach be taken, recognising there might be a a range of reasonable approaches to design, reasonable responses, and refusing on design grounds only if the proposal is outside that range of reasonable uh, designs. As I say, that wasn't an issue that needed to be decided in that case, but it's something worth dwelling upon, it, and it may well uh, need to be decided in a future case. Anyway, with that in mind, I'm now going to pass over to Mary, who's going to uh, introduce Bob and um, start our discussion with him. So over to you both. Great. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, Bob. Thank you so much for joining us. Let me just sort of introduce you. You, like us, are in fact a qualified barrister. I don't think we've had a show with when we've had a, a hat trick, as it were, uh, of all participants um, being a qualified barrister. And indeed, before you were an MP, you were a successful criminal advocate uh, and you were first elected for Bromley and Chislehurst in 2006. And you've won that position five times. And I say, I mean, five times you've served continuously since 2006. That's a tremendous record. And I, I doff my hat to you. Um, and in the, all of it, this time, you've gained incredible range of experience. You've been the shadow local government minister. You've been the shadow planning minister. And when the co coalition came into power way back in 2010, you were appointed parliamentary undersecretary at the DCLG. And you were there at the birth, as it were, of the MPPF 2012. I mean, I remember that well. I remember, yeah, I do remember that well. I'm so old. Um, but, um, and I'm going to ask you, ask you about that later. You've also served as both vice chair and deputy chair of the Tory party. And we're particularly delighted that you're with us today, fresh, as it were, back from your return at the Tory party conference in Manchester. And so my, my first question really is, how busy and how buzzy was the, um, was the conference? Well, lovely to be here, Mary. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm, uh, I'm fresh back from Manchester with a, 
uh, the standard conference cold, basically. So if I cough up wheat, <laughs> uh, that's one guaranteed thing you get out of uh, party conferences is that you'll end up with, with croaking afterwards. I think. But uh, uh, that's because you've it, been it, in the bar. You've been in the bar late at night. Come on, well, we know. We, know. we know. We, it sometimes, yeah. <laughs> we, we are all barristers on this band, aren't we? So yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think actually it, it's always the way of it uh, that um, what you get in in some of the media isn't the whole story. Mm. Yeah, it, it, it's. It was, I thought, actually um, much more positive uh, than uh, some commentators would have wanted you to believe. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was actually a, quite a lot of uh, positivity, uh, a lot of interest. Um, I did a fringe with Alex Chalk, the Justice Secretary um, uh, for the Society of Conservative Lawyers and the Bar Council and Law Society, and we were packed out there. Uh, and uh, it wasn't talking about just the usual uh, stuff. We were talking about quite seriously about where the balances are. Um, uh, we, we, between politics and law, some of the quite important constitutional issues. And really interested in enthusiasm for that, similarly from um, a fringe I did uh, on um, uh, prison reform. So it, it's not always um, uh, the people who get the biggest headlines uh, that, yes. um, that, 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 that give you the real flavour of how party conferences go. I do think there's a, there's a lot of support for the Prime Minister, it should, it should be said. I mean, I'm biased because I supported Rishi from, from day one, but I do think there's a lot of support for him. The recognition that he is steadying the ship. I think most people want to um, to get behind him and think, yeah, we can actually uh, do this. It's a tall, it's a big call uh, to get a, a fifth term in government, but it's doable. Um, I didn't go to any of the parties where people were dancing with Nigel Farage, I hasten to add. <laughs> I must say, if I'd been there, I might have been tempted to whisk Mr. Gove around the dance floor and show him a trick or two. <laughs> Uh, and and maybe maybe get him to change a few things, but anyway, I'm going to whisk him uh, around and talk about the MPEF. Where you are, <laughs> it's I have a copy of that in my handbag. It's really sad. Uh, however, let's just move, let, let's just move on. But you've given us a flavour of the mood, as it were, of the conference and the level of support for the prime minister. So I, what I want to ask you though is, what led you? What made, led you um, into politics, Bob? And well, that how means much? Just yeah, I, yeah, and I mean, you've only got a few minutes to answer. Mm, sure, questions. yeah, I guess you need a but psychiatrist. I, I, <laughs> um, and also, I, I, I want you to sort of just give us a flavour of how political life has changed yeah, okay. over your tenure. I think it's really quite simple. I was uh, at at school. I did a bit, a fair bit of debating, um, bit of acting, certain debating. I was really interested in history. That got me interested uh, in politics. Um, uh, I was persuaded to stand for the council when I was. Uh, uh, still, I think doing with pupillage, um, uh, and, and much to my surprise, got in. So I was really involved with local authority, uh, working in a London borough, and um, quite early on. And I sort of ran the two in parallel. And you do sometimes get the bug a bit. Um, so I ran that in mm. parallel whilst I was bre bu building uh, my practice up, uh, basically. Um, what's changed? Um, I think sadly, it has become more tribal. Uh, it has uh, become, I think, more confrontational always was to a degree let's not think that there was some sort of you know um rosy period of consensualism back in the mm. past but what i do think has changed is the way that social media has changed the nature of public debate uh, and so um there, there is a more uh, a more populist sometimes tone uh, mm. and i think you also find that just by the nature of it it's harder to develop um a decent argument one of the saddest yeah. is I've there's a lot of speeches in the commons now, basically chunks of sound bites so you can put them up on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I can I can relate to that. Bob, what what achievement are you most proud of? I think if I was honest, Mary, I'd say actually is chairing the Justice Committee for the last eight eight years. So a, a job rather than a specific, because I do think that's the best thing. It's great to be a minister, but I think having the chance to to bang the drum about legal issues. Uh, about the importance of the justice system, not just for the professions, important though that is, but also uh, about the rule of law and actually making sure that we fund and uh, or don't mm. and always fund uh, the justice system properly, civil as well as criminal uh, and family. It's been a real opportunity. I think that's that that's been a great thing for me to do. In terms of uh, other specifics uh, that I uh, I might be proud of, I'm actually quite proud of the reforms that we did uh, to both planning and. Um, local government finance uh, when um, Eric Pickles and Greg Clark and I were at DCLG so I do think even though we didn't achieve everything we would have liked we started some changes 
uh, mm. which are okay are still going on but the fact that we were able to shake up uh, things i think that made a difference and what advice bob would you give to a a, a person aspiring to get into politics now i, I think don't don't lose touch with your hinterland um there's a danger, I think, sometimes that one can become obsessed with politics. It isn't everything. Um, remember that most people live their lives with little involvement with politics. Um, just to, just keep in touch with people. Make sure your family are, are on side. Um, and for God's sake, keep a sense of humour. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm 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 sure behind every uh, great politician is is a strong family, as as you say. Um, so let's let's come back to some some planning related questions, if I may. Looking back um, over, I'm going to say the last 13 years because yeah. it's 13 years since we um, yeah, yeah. It, we've had the national planning policy framework, and that was introduced in a sort of bonfire of red tape when the coalition came in. There were all these planning practice guidance, PPGs, PPSs, we'd all got used to, um, and. There was a bonfire of red tape, and along came the presumption of sustainable in favour of sustainable development. And has it been a success? Do you think? I think it's mixed, frankly, uh, Mary. Mm. Um, it, it, you almost need to take a step back. Or well, most of this has been worked up in two thousand and nine when we were in opposition. Um, and the background to it is that that's when Steve Hilton uh, was very much um, uh, David Cameron's it's almost policy guru. Uh, and Steve was a very, very strong American-style localist. Uh, and uh, the um, presumption of favour sustainable development is something that Eric and I fought quite hard to get in because there was a suggestion that you should scrap all regional planning, um, have any national stuff at a very light, light touch level, uh, and essentially local communities decide what they want. Well, somewhere like the UK, that wasn't going to work. But those are sometimes the tensions in the way that policy is developed. Uh, and what emerges isn't what was necessary at the beginning. Y you may remember something called open source planning. Yes, uh, indeed. That, that, that was published that uh, um, Oliver Letwin and uh, myself and a couple of others spent a couple of bottles of wine over um, more often than not to, to get together. I think the idea was to try and strike a, ba strike a balance to move away from what was seen as a very top-down system, um, the RSSs uh, and so on, uh, and uh, one which exacerbated what I still think is a problem, actually, that communities see development as a threat rather than an opportunity, because it, particularly housing, it brings burdens um, and not very much reward. So it was based on the idea of trying to create enlightened self-interest, if you like. Mm. Mm. Um, now, did it work entirely in that way? Um, probably not. Um, but I do think it moved in a better direction, so I do think, just looking at it, um, as somebody been in local government, I chaired the um, London Assembly's uh, Regional Spatial Strategy Committee, um, drawing up mm. the London plan before that. Um, it, 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 I think we had made life too complex, and it was getting in the way uh, of delivery. And I think there was a genuine democratic deficit to some degree in it. So I think we tried to get the balance right. Um, it, it probably overestimated, or maybe we underestimated, the demands that it made of local planning authorities. Um, to uh, change uh, their, their their practices, uh, I think possibly um, we're a bit too optimistic about the willingness of um, local areas to to adopt that enlightened self interest. NIMBYism is uh, mm, a bit right. more limited than you, the, the, than you'd like. Uh, so that's why I think it's evolved somewhat to put in a few more. Um, uh, in the end, we we found ourselves as we we're going. You need to put in some more sticks. Mm. Well, what, I mean, why? Again, in a, in, a, in a sentence or two, why hasn't the government been able to do better in terms of the delivery of housing? Uh, I, th I think it's a mixture of things. Um, possibly still, uh, we haven't um, got got the, the the basics right around how we calculate housing supply, for example. Um, uh, there is the, uh, a particular a touchiness around green belts, as you know, Mary, um, and that, that's true in, in London and the South East. Um, there's also been other things which actually aren't pure planning things that have got in the way. Um, uh, there's been, I think there's a real problem with um, sufficient able and qualified planners. I think most local authority housing planning departments are woefully under-resourced. Uh, many of the district councils are arguably too small uh, to um, 
uh, to be able to cope with anything yeah. beyond the, the, the most basic size of application. Um, mm. uh, and one area where we didn't, uh, well, I think we still need to do more work, uh, we were trying to, to get something that was between the RSSs. And I saw a question, of, do I regret the abolition of the RSSs? Um, not in the current form that they were, because I do think that they had a sense uh, that they imposed upon communities without any benefit. Um, if I was starting again, would I move to something that's somewhere in the middle, perhaps? Um, possibly so. I think the other bit that we didn't get right uh, was it enough incentives uh, for communities around housing. So, for example, a new homes bonus um, didn't run long enough uh, and wasn't in enough, I think, to make it worth communities' while to take on housing in the numbers that we would have hoped for. And that's partly because we were getting pushed back from the Treasury um, in a time of uh, you know pretty tight budgets as to how much was going to be available. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, it's always. I've always found it a curious thing that there was this idea that you incentivize local authorities to accept development by uh, enabling them to um, raise money and retain the money um, that you know retain more of the local taxes, and so therefore be more incentivized to promote uh, development. And yet, by and large, the um, you know the taxes, the money that could come in is 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 actually not regarded as relevant for the purposes of making the decision. It's just one of those slightly frustrating things I've always. Found. I, I, I agree. If I was going to do anything now, Mary, I'd have a chance. I go further and actually say it's a legitimate thing to take on board. Yeah, I, I, it, it, really... it, if it brings revenue into an area, which will then be used on services, I don't see why that shouldn't be a legitimate planning consideration. Personally, I yeah. think we'd be too 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 coy about that. I, I completely agree. Um, and if you're spending money um, uh, housing people who, um, for example, have no homes, and you're yeah. putting them up in accommodation which is expensive, it, that again, yeah. it's it's ridiculous that you're not we're not factoring all that in. Okay. Um, what about neighbourhood plans? I mean, have they really helped delivery, or have they hindered delivery? Um, I think broadly speaking, I mean, again, not as much as we would have liked, and that's because I think the take ups have been patchy for a start. I mean. There, for example, are very few in urban areas. Um, I think maybe one or two, maybe three, virtually in the whole of Greater London, for example. So it tends to be villages, doesn't it? Um, and it may also uh, be used quite often um, uh, in areas where there's not an up-to-date local plan. Um, so it, they tend to be things to restrict development rather than the idea that the community should be um, engaged in driving the nature mm. of that, which, which was the idea that we had at the beginning. Yeah, but as a as a as a as a politician who served as a local government politician, do you, do you think that um, actually local elected councillors who feel resp who are uh, supposed to be responsible for the local plan, do you think there's a sort of democratic deficit with the idea of a small group of small group of usually rather well to do articulate people running neighbourhood plans? Well, interesting. I, I think Steve Hilton wanted to put them all out to to, to referendum, to to referenda. Um, was, was Steve's idea. He saw it very much as these American town meeting things. <laughs> um, and that, and David wasn't persuaded of that. I think that would have been a, a real issue. I think there's a bit of that. I think uh, what we haven't done is to give communities um, enough support in drawing up the neighbourhood plans to um, give them, the, if you like, the the courage and encouragement to do it. So it can be sort of the the usual suspects to some degree. Mm. Uh, maybe we should be looking again at the criteria that are required for the community consultation, uh, how that's done. Perhaps you can broaden that out in various ways. Uh, and should there also be, perhaps, can we help uh, these folk by uh, some bit of template for what you should have in an enable plan? Because in some cases, you maybe have parish council, you know, you've got a clerk part-time um, uh, and uh, then the individual councillors. Uh, and yeah. not a great deal of professional background to it. Indeed, indeed. Um, now, as you've mentioned um, your role as uh, chair of the Justice Committee uh, and how proud you are of that, uh, and I know in that capacity you've been looking into uh, prison overcrowding, yeah. and I note that a consultation has just ended, um, yeah. extending further permitted development rights. Yeah. The government seems to be... Um, uh, constantly t tinkering with permitted development rights and one of the latest changes is to give open prisons the same permitted development rights that currently um uh 
closed prisons, as it were, have and allow you to um, build additional development up to 25% more yeah. of the footprint of the buildings. Um, and, I mean, as the consultation itself says, that is th the purpose behind it is to enable capacity to be increased. And, I mean, I guess the reason you're doing that is because actually government is finding it difficult to actually get planning permissions for new prisons. Well, that's right. I mean, when our committee looked at it, um, uh, of the 20,000 on new prison places um, that were supposed to be um, on stream by about 2030 or so, um, uh, four of those prisons are, are bogged down in planning uh, and are, are nowhere near um, getting approval. So you've only got two that are likely to come on stream, Fosway and, and Glen Barber. Um, so that's going to be nothing like enough. So it's a bit of um, sticking plaster, I suspect, uh, to try and get some additional capacity. Um, for myself, I think the real problem is not a planning one. It's actually that we send too many to prison uh, uh, and we actually need to reduce the, popula the prison population. That might not be popular with all my Conservative Party colleagues. But I think, um, I think actually, yeah, Alex Chalk put it very well. Um, prison is for the people who we're scared of and rightly scared of, the dangerous people. Um, not necessarily to the people we're annoyed with. Mm. Um, and over my years in criminal work, yeah, some very nasty people I dealt with, um, and they deserve to be locked up. An awful lot of them were in an awful mess uh, through a vast range of things that had gone wrong earlier on in their lives. And we haven't joined up the whole system, and this is just one little uh, impact of that, because um, mm. so we haven't got the alternatives to custody, um, and we're having to forever increase uh, uh, the numbers uh, and that has an impact on the planning system in this instance but that's if you like uh, a, a symptom uh, of the underlying disease that we haven't mm. joined up of our approach to criminal justice i digress i digress to say i've really enjoyed watching a, a show about um prisons and rugby and um various members of the uh successful mm. england rugby uh, team that won the world cup led by martin johnson going into an open prison and and running um, rugby training sessions, and it, it's the most inspiring show actually, and I commend it to our listeners. But that's a digression. I'm sorry, I, I, I shouldn't digress. Um, now I'm going to I, I've got some other questions for you, but I'm going to open it up first of all to um, some of the others, and I'm going to start with Paul because I know Paul has a plane to catch. So Paul, right. would you like to ask Bob your question? I, I will. And uh, can I start off by saying, firstly, Mary, yes, I commend that show as well. It's brilliant. And yeah, secondly, yeah. secondly, Bob, I started off at the Criminal Bar. A lot of my friends are still at the Criminal Bar in Manchester. Um, and I'm delighted to say that, it, that it's on your radar about the difficulties that the Criminal Bar are in and the, the effect of underfunding upon that. So I wholly endorse what you said. Nothing to do with the show. But um, well, thanks, Paul. Let's go. Uh, I, I didn't make have to make the wise decision to do, do planning. <laughs> well, yeah, I, mean, I, I I moved out relatively quickly, but I think that was down yeah. to my my designs. So, yeah, sure. Whenever we get a guest on, Bob, yeah. uh, you I always end up going on Google and looking back the guest in the past, right. uh, and just before MPPF back in 2011, mm. we're talking about bringing forward wind turbines and wind farms. Yeah. Uh, be associated with local communities and neighbourhood planning and localism would help to facilitate that mm. because buying for the local communities and I had in mind when I uh, well, remember hearing that sort of thing that you've got a sort of French system of you know we get our cheap electricity yeah. because we're the one back from the the wind farms so help me with this what was what were you expecting that perhaps neighbourhood plans and the localism agenda would deliver and has it delivered that and will the new amendments to MPPF deliver anything better? I think the new members to MPF are, are, are a step in the right direction um, in making it easier to do um, onshore wind, because I think the moratorium didn't make sense on the blanket um, uh, approach at all. Um, I think that the difficulty you often have with, with, with um, any policy department developing uh, ideas is that you then run into the Treasury. And the, 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 the issue we had throughout was that the other bit that we wanted to put in place were the incentives for the communities. Yeah. And we could never get the, the Treasury to stump up the money um, to uh, give them, for example, any we a big enough fight to get sill, for example. Uh, when we thought about, can we do something specific around wind farms? Um, uh, you could never get the sign off, for reasons I still think are unjustified, to doing exactly what you do in France or Germany, where um, you, you get a, a cheap tariff. 
Um, so the system was intended well, but for a vast a number of reasons, maybe that says something about the siloed, siloed way in which we conduct government uh, in the UK. Um, the other bits would never have joined on properly. And, and the pretense that, that people aren't really acting out of self-interest, that everybody's acting in the public interest, whereas in reality, if a community takes a disproportionate hit by accommodating yeah. a development, they should get something out of it. Well, but that's exactly right. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, either morally or, or practically. Um, you know, they take the hit for the greater good. Uh, so we ought to give them something for that. Uh, thank you, Bob. Vive la France. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, what's your question? Thanks, please. Mary. Hi, Bob. Good good to see Hi, you. Hi, Charlie. Good to uh, see you um, As I said to our viewers when I started the show, you, you are one of the founding fathers of, of the NPPF. And so I'm keen to understand if there was one piece of advice you could give Michael Gove uh, uh, regarding his proposed changes to it and what to do in response to the consultation. What would that piece of advice be? Um, for God's sake, don't change it again. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I, I mean, whatever it is, make your mind up and stick to it. Because I think that the toing and froing uh, has been a real problem mm. uh, on, you know, on delivery and actually for the credibility uh, of the system. Yes. Uh, and yeah, poor old Michael has already had his um, fingers burnt a bit over housing targets. Um, give me some, some of my colleagues, I have to say, around that. But I say, look, Get the Prime Minister on side and just stick to it this time uh, and don't be forever changing it because yeah, people want certainty, don't they? Yeah, there's a, a, I don't know if it's an apocryphal tale or not, but I, I understand uh, someone said that once that John Rose was once invited into government many years ago, saying, What would you do? You know, this, that, and the other. And he passed over a blank sheet of A4. So that's what I'll do. <laughs> I'll play I'll like that, I, 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 don't, I don't know if that's true or an urban myth, but it's. Oh, it's, no. it's it sounds out right. <laughs> exactly. It's a very small scene conservative approach, isn't there? <laughs> don't do anything. Exactly. Yeah. No, thank you. Really interesting. Thank you very much indeed. No problem. Chris, what's your question? Bob. Hi, Bob. Hi. Um, Hi, Chris. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, we watch your career and we're very impressed of your position on a number of different things. Uh, on Brexit, on the Withdrawal Act, um, on justice, on legal aid. Um, there's a lot of admiration for your position and I wish that actually a lot of politicians in your party were where you are and not not elsewhere. Um, my question, um, it's about housing as it happens, uh, yeah. and um, it's about Bromley. I've been to Bromley a few times now. Uh, we've had a tall tower granted twice, 150 houses, then 250 houses. Yeah. Um, and on the second occasion, very, very little affordable housing was achievable because it was a tall building, beautiful architectural design, designed by Ian Ritchie. But there's no money for the affordable after that. I think we did 19% first homes, but certainly no social rented. And my, my experience at Bromley is that, you know, they had a reasonable good delivery record until recent years, um, about 625 a year. Last year, Bromley delivered 120 homes, well, the last reported year. And of that, 27 were affordable in a major London borough, 27 affordable houses. The year before, it was 11. And with right to buy losses, they dropped down to 6 and 12. So... Basically, affordable housing delivery in Bromley has collapsed. Collapsed. What is the answer? I'm sat here in Cheltenham, Alex Chalk's Ooh. constituency. Yeah. Just over there, 5,000 houses are coming out of the Green Belt. Over there in Gloucester, 2,000 houses are coming out of the Green Belt. People are taking land out of the Green Belt and delivering housing and affordable housing. Bromley won't touch its Green Belt. How is that fair? And why will you not? Why will Bromley not do anything about it? They're your councillors supporting your seat. Well, one thing I think one's uh, you probably know, Chris, is that the uh, extent to which uh, the MPs can ever try and lie and manage the councillors is uh, <laughs> <laughs> much more theoretic than, than, than anything else. They're pretty fiercely independent. But you you must have a view. You must have well, a view. Yeah, no, I do. Look, and uh, I think it, it, it's been very disappointing. Uh, I think there have been sometimes it can be as simple as. Um, Turnover in the planning in the planning department. Um, we've had a real challenge actually with, with with planners in Bromley over the last two or three years. I think we're not unique in that with other London boroughs, um, but we have had some some, some real issues uh, there with experienced people retiring, as it happens. A number of good people uh, left, uh, and uh, that's actually I think rather gummed up 
uh, the works. There has been, to some degree, a lack of political will from some of my colleagues uh, to do it. Like got to, we've got to recognise that. I think things are changing a bit. Um, we've uh, had a bit of a shuffle of the of the leadership team uh, amongst the um, executive members of the council, um, and uh, we've now got uh, portfolio holders specific, specifically dealing with this, um, who's herself a housing professional. So we're starting now actually to build our own houses uh, for affordable. It's a small number at the moment, um, but it's about 250, 300 uh, are currently planned. Now that's on council-owned sites uh, at present. That's, that's since those stats that you had 21, 22, this is stuff sort of starting uh, this year. So I think there is a bit of a change, uh, and I welcome that, frankly. Um, the I think the other two things that uh, you do have to bear in mind uh, uh, with Bromley is there is a real concern about tall buildings because of the Croydonification. And that's why, for example, I mean, I know the, develop, the, 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 the two tall blocks that you talked of, uh, and it did help that they were good quality because there was concern that will they be the sort of things that people were storing Croydon and that gets a pushback from residents. Um, on the other thing about Greenbelt, and I, I, I'm not against personally um, looking at, uh, uh, at Greenbelt um, sensibly, and I think possibly in London as a whole, uh, we ought to uh, we ought to be prepared to do that because let, let's read out some bits of Greenbelt no longer fulfil what we probably think of as a Greenbelt function. Uh, that said, quite a lot of the um, Greenbelt in Bromley uh, is either Commons, just as Commons, Hayes Commons, um, uh, Country Parks, um, or when you get down towards the southern bit of the Bagra, uh, Barra agricultural land. So um, it, it, it's not quite as straightforward. And maybe the, the, the contrast I'd suggest with, say, Cheltenham or, uh, is I think there you can do exactly what is, is being suggested. You can create a, a mini community in the Green Belt, can't you? In effect, create 5,000 houses, sort of new village. Um, there's not really a space to do that in some way like Bromley. It's more likely to be add-ons to existing urban uh, urban envelope. I assume that's what's most performed in, in Cheltenham. So that's, that makes it a bit harder sometimes. It's an urban extension, and you could easily yeah. do an urban extension yeah. to Bromley. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think we're going to have to look at it. It's, it is interesting. It's not just, of course, that the council is very anti-Greenbelt. Um, uh, it's very anti-building on Greenbelt, um, as are a number of other London boroughs, but, of course, the mayor is as well. Mm. And that's perhaps a little surprising that Sadiq has um, uh, gone very hard uh, on saying, I want more housing. Actually, his delivery on affordable, again, has been pretty poor, it must be said. And that means it's part of political point, just a statement of fact. Uh, and one of those things has been uh, his very strong um, objection to any building uh, in the Green Belt. Um, and so, yeah, last time, it, 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 you could always get a bidding war between both main parties' candidates, the same we won't touch Green Belt. And I'm not that's, sure a really, that's a really fair point. Is the answer, quickly, is the answer to try and build a consensus that both parties stop pretending we don't need the Green Belt and just come forward? And you, you've said it there, you, you're not against looking at the Green Belt. You're a very, very sensible MP. What about a consensus? If we could find one, I'd be delighted to. Um, uh, and that comes back to my perhaps point we at the very beginning. One of the sad things is um, the more, um, as I always said, almost tribalistic, certainly more confrontational uh, attitudes. It's harder to build consensus in the current climate. And I think that's a shame because there were times when I was on Havering Council years back where actually we did. Uh, and I think it's a pity that's got harder. Uh, maybe that requires some intervention, and I do actually hope that the mayor could um, uh, use uh, his convening power, his or hers, depending on who, on who wins, to try and pull that together. And maybe also, the other thing I'd say, Chris, given the nature of where the London boundary is, which isn't entirely natural, we probably need to, to involve the, the neighbouring home counties as well. Sounds, the, sounds, the, 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 the rather sounds like a really big man. <laughs> <laughs> a sort of mini regional plan. Funny uh, that. Might, Funny uh, that. <laughs> you could call it a sort of a boundaries plan or something like that. But if you're going to re review Green Belt, it makes sense to review it in Dartford as much as you do in, in Bexley, for example. Thank you for your camera. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. For, uh, uh, that was a very interesting exchange. Sasha. Thank you very much, Mary. Bob, you talked earlier about incentives. I think that's really interesting because. I think one of the fundamental problems we have at local government level is the system gives complete power, very, very important power to local politicians to effectively grow our planning commission. Mm. But, but there seems to be a status quo currently where too often councillors take what they perceive to be the safe and popular yep. 
decision, which is to refuse because, frankly, they chuck it elsewhere, it goes to the planning inspector. That's right, yeah, and they, and they blame the inspector. Exactly. So how do we, I mean, you've been involved, as you say, with Havering, and I'm sure you've had moments in the House of Commons when you've had some really decision, difficult decisions to take. How do we incentivize members to have a wider perspective, to think about the public interest and think beyond just the immediacy of the decision before them and the safe or popular decision? Give us an, give us an insight into a councillor's approach and how we can change that. I think one thing I do in some areas, for example, is get rid of elections by one third, um, because you know, in those areas that do have elections by a third, they're always looking over their shoulder uh, at the next election. At least you've got a chance on the four-year terms if you do it early on in the cycle. You know, and you, you probably give given advice to clients, so we'll get it on early in the cycle, um, uh, and then you've got a better chance of uh, having a more considered view. Uh, that, that's one point uh, around it. I think, secondly, um, we need maybe to make sure whatever incentives, revised incentive package we have, is much more directly related to the um, development itself. Um, so there is a, a, a very clear um, a benefit to the community that, that takes the hit, something that the councillors can point to and say, look. Would you, would you be interested, do you think, would it be sensible to try and extend the length of duration of your period in office? So you, as you say, you do have this wider perspective. Well, You're not terrified of that. I think in some, some places you, you, you do six years, don't you? Something like that. So that, that's, that's not impossible. The other thing I do think, uh, and it comes back to my concern, which I've had ever since I was a minister, um, which is a long time ago now, um, uh, about the um, uh, uh, resilience of local authority planning departments, uh, is that a lot of our local authorities, frankly, particularly the, the Shire districts, are too small. Um, uh, and therefore they don't have decent, uh, they can't resource their planning departments to the level that they'd like. Uh, they don't have people experienced in dealing with big applications. Um, uh, and it does tend to make it very parochial. I and mean, I've come to the view, which I didn't have before, I moved to unitaries everywhere outside um, the, the Mets now. And then at least you've got uh, that broader, you know, county-wide view of the thing that might remove some of the immediate uh, localism in you. So there's no single silver built bullet, but I think maybe a mixture of those things. Thank you. Um, and, and maybe better training, finally. Um, you know, uh, a, 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 a bit more training for, for people who sit on the planning, on the planning committees. It is, you know, we forget sort of, in some elements, quasi-judicial, and that's all we're, not, not, not always recognised. Mm. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. So now, Bob, I'm just going to come back, if I may, to a, a question I was going to ask you um, about um, infrastructure. And I know there's been a, you know, a, a, a huge hoo-ha um, this week, and actually for the last couple of weeks, about the cancellation of various phases of HS2, and I, I don't really want to get into that. But what I wanted to ask Thanks. you, <laughs> yeah, that's a hospital pass. I, I wanted to ask you about, um, again, just sort of reflecting on um, the last uh, 13 or so years in in government, how we've done as a country in terms of infrastructure with the DCO regime, because that's something that um, the, um, the Tory party and then the coalition kept on. Um, yeah. And do you think we do you think we've been a bit more successful uh, with our use of DCOs and the delivery of road and energy infrastructure? Is is that more of a success story? Do you think than I, 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 housing, yeah. for example? Yeah, yeah, I, I think it has done better than housing, frankly. Uh, and so, I mean, I do think that's that, that's justified. Many of the constraints around some of the infrastructure projects have been financial rather than um, planning mm -hmm. processes. Um, so, I, I think that's broadly justified. There may be tweaks and changes that you can make uh, from experience. But I, I think that's a, a good thing. Um, uh, and we need to maybe see if we can actually roll that out. The suggestion, I think, of actually extending uh, the scope uh, that DCOs uh, could be used for. That depends on what you define as, uh, as an NSIP, doesn't it? Yes, but, indeed it does. Indeed, And you're absolutely right. There was a time when we all we were all wondering whether, for example, housing would be... Uh, yeah. Uh, something that would be allowed to be delivered through a uh, a DCO, so that, for example, if you had a very significant uh, new residential scheme which needed a new or a significantly improved interchange on a motorway, you could do do it all in one hit. Um, but that has not yet come to pass. 
Um, well, Bob, can I just say thank you so much for uh, your candid uh, answers. It's been delightful to get to know you and to speak to you um, over the course of this week. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. And um, I, I pass it back the baton back to you, Charlie. Thanks, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Mary. Mary. And thank you for me too, Bob. It's been absolutely insightful and fascinating and very enjoyable. So thank you very much. Now, in two weeks' time, thank you. I think by my calculation is the 19th of October. You never trust my maths. We have um, Community pa Planning Powerhouse, Rosie Pearson, Chair of uh, the Community pa Planning Alliance, founder of the Essex Pylons Campaign, and, and many more. Um, so Rosie's going to join us. Um, in two weeks from now. But until then, um, can we say again, well, thank you very much indeed. And right. uh, we will see you all in a fortnight. Good, Good to see you all. Many right. thanks. Cheers. Cheers. See you soon. Right. Bye. Yeah, absolutely. See you soon. Cheers.